last time uh, I, I was arguing with you about some of uh, the novelties that Dante introduces within the poem at the start of Purgatory. One, uh, there are some formal, uh, what we would call descriptive um, novelties, light, the time, uh, the question of time. Uh, there are some moral innovations, the, the focus on uh, the connection, the subtle connection between freedom and uh, new beginnings. Uh, the idea of freedom as, first of all, a political value, uh, and the meeting with Cato, uh, so that uh, though insisting on these novelties, and that the novelty and the new, or the possibility of renewal, is exactly uh, at, at stake in Dante's new poetics, I was also trying to emphasize, and I think that that came through, uh, hopefully uh, with, with clarity, the whole tension between the old and the new, uh, the, the pool of the past, the sense of nostalgia, in whether it's an existential one or in the biblical Exodus story, the nostalgia for the, the, uh, the, the time of uh, safety, apparent safety in, uh, of the Jews in, in Egypt, even though within, under the slavery, uh, that Egypt stands for. So these were some of the issues, and then we moved on to Canto II, where we, we f specifically on the encounter of Dante with a musician by the name of Casella, where Dante uh, dramatizes as if unaware, as if mindless of what, I, of what had happened in the previous Canto, in the experience of the previous Canto. He just lapses into exactly the same time, type of predicament that the previous canto had featured. Namely, uh, here he is in, indulging in memories of the past, uh, lapsing into a form of uh, idolatrous self-confrontation. He's listening to the beauty and lure of the canto, of the, of the, of the song that Casella will sing for him. And then finally, the presence of uh, the eruption of Cato once again, who focuses on the ethical uh, demands of the place. Purgatory is a place of moral purification and so uh, he urges all the souls that had gathered around the song of, uh, of, of uh, Casella to move away and the language that he uses is that of dispersion uh, like doves, like pigeons, like doves that uh, go on dispersing throughout the, the, the plain. Um, Clearly, what, uh, uh, in retrospect, what is apparent, I think, in all of these this, uh, situations is Dante's uh, insistence on the power, on the importance of a communal, a communal destiny, a communal fate. Though this communal fate appears as defeated. Let me just explain what I mean, and then we move on with, uh, with uh, today's readings. In the case of Cato, Cato has been defeated by the civil war between Pompey and Caesar to the point that he had to commit suicide. In the case of uh, Casella's song, that poem had managed to gather around itself not only Dante but all the other souls who had become mindless of what they really were supposed to do, continue their climbing up the mountain, and Cato intervenes and he also shatters that the, as illusory that form of community. But what, it, what, what I think that Dante is after is the following. There may have been defeat and, and therefore the value of these experiments in communal, communal existence, that of Cato uh, who commits suicide and that of the aesthetic gathering around the poetry, they are both partial and defeated and yet they contain seeds that will be necessary for his rethinking about how to renew and reconstruct uh, his idea of uh, the common historical destiny. This is really what 
uh, and I hope it's, it's fairly clear, and we shall see this a little bit on uh, today. Um, uh, I, will, I turn very briefly now to Canto V for a couple of reasons, because it's uh, Canto V. If, if I had to give a general title to the Canto, I would say uh, that this deals with uh, uh, Dante's sense of uh, retrospective knowledge. I have been really focusing on a Dante turn to the future, as you know, a Dante who, th who, who thinks and reflects on hope who thinks and reflects about issues such as uh, uh, the, the, uh, the future, the future in general, that this is freedom, is the, and, and, and time is the future, is the real time. Uh, nothing else really matters, because everything else can only be understood as part of the future, even when it's past, <laughs> with, with the logical underlying assumption that that which is past was once the future, the only real, the only reality of time. So he understands in Purgatorio how time moves in a uni direction, which is future oriented. So it's, it's really a time as future that, 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 that turns out to be also a return to the Garden of Eden, but that is a kind of second thought uh, for him. Here now, though, in Canto V, Dante meets souls that, um, the, the, that sort of bring to the fore for him the power of retrospection. These are souls who um, manage to repent at the last minute. It's almost as if, again, it's time. It's a question of time, but a time that is sort of inexhaustible. It's always possible to fall back, reflect, and turn one's life around. One figure that he meets, and this is Canto V around line 90, you, you shall see in a moment why I select him, uh, he meets a figure uh, who is, uh, uh, he, he, he will identify himself uh, uh, Bonconte da Montefeltro, who is the son, by the way, of a man with whom we met in Canto 27 of Inferno. And this is why I like to focus on him, the break between the past and the future, the sun being always uh, a sort of statement about a project, about a future, pro sun or the door, uh, a statement about, about the future. And, and, and uh, the father ends up in hell, the son ends up in uh, this purgatorial ledge on the way to redemption. So there is no chain of natural necessity and causality between the past and the present or the future. There is a focus on freedom, because once you break that, that bond of necessity, you are really opening up, inaugurating the idea that we are free, that we are really free to make ourselves regardless of what antecedents we may have behind us. But there is another little detail, which is a formal, it really tells you something about Dante's art. So here he goes, uh, lines uh, 88 or so, then another spoke, pray, so may the, that desire be satisfied which draws thee to the uh, high mountain. What an extraordinary, what extraordinary language about desire drawing us. We are in, this is Dante's universe of desire. We're impelled by desire. And desire is really what moves us. We, it's, it's love that moves us. It's desire that impels us to go uh, one way or the other. Do thou, do thou with gracious pity help mine. I was of Montefeltro. I am bon Conte, and I hope now that you are sensitive to this temporal, to the tenses, the disjunction in tenses. I already pointed those out for you in the canto of Ugolino, and here too how bon Conte is asserting his, uh, his identity in the mode of the presence, present and, and detaching himself with the view of, of the use of the past tense from uh, the, the um, the, tr the family, Montefeltro. Now that Giovanna nor I uh, has a care for me so that I go among this with downcast brow. And I said to him, what force or what chance or what chance, uh, the, the, the ter term or adventure, adventure more than chance. Chance is too heavy a word and I will come back to this a little bit, a, a little bit later where Dante uh, reflects on the significance of chance. Took thee so far from Campaldino that the burial place was never known. This is an extraordinary scene, an extraordinary encounter for one very autobiographical reason. And the reason is this is that Dante fought at the battle of Campaldino. It was one, the moment of uh, 
his great maturity, his great entering into the, battlef the battlefield of life when he discovers that now, because of the victory that the Florentines had in Campaldino, that he also can have claims about himself, about his own family and political future. But now he meet meets a victim. And there have been those who go on claiming with very little evidence, as if you are in a battle, I don't know how many of you know, uh, the field of Campaldino, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty large, about 25 miles um, east, uh, east of Florence. Uh, it, the idea is that so those who go on claiming that maybe this is someone that Dante killed actually in battle and now sort of retrieves him, brings him back. There's no evidence for this, but it is a painful autobiographical moment for them, a moment <coughs> where he did experience violence and he perpetrated violence. And this is the answer. Ah, he replied that the foot of the Casentino, rather than answering the question of the battle, he goes on thinking about his death and recounts his death. This is a poem about births. You remember, I always like to say this, about the event of being born and the portentous quality that, it, that being born implies, the kind of alterations that we all can, can bring on the world around us, uh, <laughs> by the very fact that we were born. Now, he talks about death. Ah, he replied, the foot of the Casentino, a stream crosses called the Archiano, which rises above the hermitage in the Apennines to the place where its name is lost. I came wounded in the throat, flying on foot and blooding the plain. There I lost sight and speech. I ended on the name of Mary, and there fell, and only my flesh remained. I will tell the truth, and do thou tell it again among the living. God's angel took me, and he from hell cried, O thou from heaven, why dost thou rob me, and so on. The reason why I'm really reading this passage, not only to tell you about this notion of the power of time, and the power of retrospection, right? Looking back, the, the final moment of one's life is the decisive moment that uh, confers a coherence and a meaning to one's life, okay? We were born and we are born with certain expectations of what we can do, but death becomes the revelatory event. So that's fine. This is really the point of this passage. But there is another point. Dante deploys the same rhetorical genre of the debate which he had used in the encounter with uh, uh, Bonconte's father so that by the sameness of the rhetorical genre, you are forced to really couple them together. And yet the point is that of the distance between father and son, that of the distance in the temporal disjunctions between the past and the present and the future. The canto ends with six lines, which are extraordinary lines, where um, sentimentalists, as occasionally I am, uh, will go on even seeing a subtle allusion of Dante to his own uh, wife. It's, a, it's an encounter with uh, a Pia de Tolomei, a woman from Siena, and clearly this little passage is meant to uh, refocus, remind us of Francesca in Canto V of Inferno. It's the exact symmetrical canto. These are the lines uh, uh, which I will read. I will go on reading also in Italian. You read it in English. Uh, uh, Professor Margaret Brooks was asking me to uh, give an, some evidence of uh, what the Italian language it sounds like. And uh, so it's a moment of nostalgia for, for you too, I take. Uh, so pray when thou hast returned to the world and are rested from the long way, the third sp spirit fall on the second. Do thou remember me who am La Pia? It's a sort of uh, an epitaph of La Pia who was mistreated by here by, by the husbands, and yet uh, incredibly forgiving. And the, and the word ends with, uh, and the passage ends with uh, uh, the word gem, which in Italian is gemma, uh, Dante's wife's name. Uh, so one wonders if Pia also doesn't stand the kind of sort of wishful thinking on the part of Dante that his wife, whom he had, because of exile, had been forced to leave behind, uh, may also Forgive. That's the point. Is Dante introducing this radical category of forgiveness, which is the true scandal. If you want to begin again, then forgiveness is exactly what's demanded. Let me read the passage in Italian and we move on. De, quando tu sarai tornato al mondo e riposato della lunga via, 
seguitò il terzo spirito al secondo, ricordati di me che sono la pia. Siena mi fe, disfece mi maremma, salsi colui che nanellata pria, disposando Madea con la sua gemma. Now we move to, after this highly, I find it a, a, a passage of a great pathos, as all of them are, uh, great intimacy, uh, where Dante is really involved, and, and just as he is obliquely involved with Bonconte, they fought in the same battle on opposite uh, sides, uh, and, and then this encounter with Pierre de Tolomei, we, we, we turn into a public canto, a political canto. Uh, and and uh, let me see, let me just try to explain a couple of things before we move on to something uh, that I care about here uh, in terms of the, the Canto 10 and 11. That's how he begins Canto 6. Political Canto, like Canto 6 of Inferno, and like Canto 6 of Paradise. You know that now, the sim principle of symmetry at work. This is not. Canto 6 of Inferno is about the city of Florence. Canto 6 of Purgatory is about Italy and the disarray, the chaos, the, the disunity of, uh, of the country. Uh, and here it starts, when the game of hazard breaks up, the loser is left disconsolate, going over his throws again, and sadly learns his lesson. With the other, all the people go off. One goes in front, one seizes him from behind, another at his side recalls himself to his memory. He does not stop, but listens to this one and that one. Each to whom he reaches his hand presses on him no longer, and so he saves himself from the throngs. Such was I in that dense crowd, turning my face to them this way and that, and by promising I got free from them. There was the other time and so on. It's an extraordinary simile to explain. That's the burden of the simile that uh, all the penitents are so surprised and seeing Dante alive in the beyond that they go all after him. He is, there's a throng of people pressing on him. That's the simile. But the simile that he uses is that of a winner in a game of hazard. That is to say, he is the winner, Dante is the winner, and they all go after him, and no, they all neglect Virgil. Virgil is the loser. And, and therefore, the simile introduces a language which is extraordinary. It is as if Dante were speaking of his salvation, of the uniqueness of this journey that he's undertaking in terms of a game of hazard. We all have been thinking that this is really a providential journey. And now he is casting it as if it were just a game of chance. Here is the word chance that he uses, hazard. It's, it's, it's an interesting metaphor. First of all, from the point of view of, uh, of, of the, the language of play. This is playful. It's a way of almost of casting one's salvation as the casting of the, of the, of, 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 of the dice. Uh, it's a lot, a lottery here that someone are, are lose and someone, someone win. And then says, well, I was born after the incarnation, so I had the, 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 uh, the, the possibility of saving myself and Virgil did not. It also, it's an interesting metaphor because it really introduces the question of play in uh, Dante's theological conception. And it's an, an issue that I will talk about much more extensively when we reach paradise. But one thing is clear, that Dante understands that the relationship between, and that's, that's all I will say unless you press me a little later, but we'll talk more about this metaphor, that Dante understands that the relationship between the soul and God is a relationship shaped by risk on both sides. And that this idea of risk that would seem to be a blind casting of the dice, in effect, constitutes the freedom that the human beings can have in the scheme of things. The whole point of salvation is, by using this language of hazard and chance, is a rescue. It's disengaged from my, the idea that God knows it all and we are going to, and we are determined in what we do. No, no, Dante is saying, by focusing on a time-bound metaphor, is that we are engaged in a risky relationship. And it's in all relationships between God and the soul, there is this element of 
danger. That's it. That's the metaphor. Um, to make it more precise, so you don't you 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 know where I'll be going uh, in the days ahead. Whenever uh, uh, in antiquity they would discuss, uh, mainly Boethius is the most important author. Uh, the relationship between human freedom and the, and, and and God's foreknowledge. They would always present a case to say that God is outside of time, or he says being outside of time, all times converge in God, and so that God sees all things in, uh, in the present. So that should really, God is here, it's a point of view which is transcendent and therefore uh, uh, synoptic, and we are in a diachronic world, uh, past, present, and future, but everything is at the same time. We think that we live, we live in a world where we do not know what tomorrow may bring us, what are decisions we make now have already been, uh, what kind of consequences, uh, whether they're unpredictable or they have been determined by things that escape our control, but God knows. And this is the Boethian, Boethian scheme of harmonizing God's foreknowledge and human freedom. It doesn't take too much to, to realize that this is really a little bit of uh, uh, delusion because you know either I'm free or am I not free. Uh, it may be that God knows it all, uh, but doesn't doesn't mean that He wills that I that I do what I do. He knows, but uh, He does not will it. And yet, you know, He knows, and I'm here, and I don't know. So my own freedom is still a little bit of uh, uh, rhetorical. Dante does it differently. It's a departure from Boethius. The relationship between God's foreknowledge, foreknowledge and the soul's uh, being in time is one that, that introduces the question of chance and hazard. Uh, and that involves both God, both God and the soul. And to be very precise, he doesn't say it here, and that's why I hesitate to get into that. I would like to work with a text to, be, to make this very clear. The issue is that in a love relationship between God and the soul, we are always at risk, always at risk. And if you accept the principle of a love economy regulating the universe, which does, Dante does, certainly does, then you un understand this notion of hazard uh, in, a, in uh, not as a, a principle of uh, uh, just uh, a chance in the sense of uh, um, uh, casual, uh, uh, blind randomness, but in, in the sense of, uh, of uh, this risk uh, proposition, risk element. Then the canto uh, goes on, after this particular metaphor, goes on with another meeting between two poets. Uh, yes, Can I ask right now, what do please. You mean by love economy? The economy, love, the economy of love. The question, the clarification is, what do I mean by the love economy? Uh, the Dante's universe, it's a universe of love. Uh, and that's how creation takes place, the creation of the universe, the creation of human beings. So we are, uh, the involvement that we as, every soul has with God is one of love. And just as in the relationship between, say, Beatrice and Dante, there is an element of risk in loving. What is the risk in loving? I can think of several. I think we are all grown up for grown ups to understand that one loves and one may not be reciprocated in love. That's a pretty bad risk. Certainly, it's a risk of God who creates and may not be loved, which is the story of what disobedience is. And certainly, it's the existential experience of human beings to be involved with someone. Either we love the wrong person, with, then we say wisely, "I was loving the wrong person." I'm being ironic about with that idea of wisdom. Or discovering that indeed in every relation there is time, feelings change. We have so many ways of thinking about it. And there is a, uh, Dante's response is, uh, look, uh, he, he, he likes figures. We should, we should talk about this. Like Francis, who goes to pray on the cliffs at night because he wants to dramatize. The idea that even a prayer puts you at risk of being heard or not being heard, of being disappointed, of re discovering that the world does not go the way you want it to go. And that which is true in prayer is true in love. Okay? That's all I was saying. I wasn't saying anything. Um, uh, uh, 
uh, more than that. In Canto VI also, the political canto, there is an encounter between two poets. One is Virgil with um, a Sordello, who is a Mantuan poet. They all share the same birthplace, mantra, across the centuries. They meet, and the very idea of Mantua, they, they ask uh, uh, Virgil, Virgil starts saying Mantua, clearly playing with the famous uh, uh, epitaph, I think, this is the, 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 the line interrupts there, it says, Mantua made me, you know, the famous epitaph written on, uh, in, in Naples where Virgil is, uh, is buried, uh, Mantua made me, um, and uh, uh, ca the, the, the South Calabri took me away, took me away. Uh, I sang the, f the, the, the arms, the Aeneid, uh, the herds, uh, the Georgics, and the story about the bucolics, the fields. It's uh, just, just in two lines, the account of his whole life. So he starts saying Mantua, I think alluding to this birthplace, once again the birth, and Sordello and he embrace. Uh, this embrace, this existential encounter, this other little moment, which is insubstantial because they can't really embrace their spirits. Another failure after the one that we saw with Casella in, 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 Canto, uh, in Canto II of, uh, of Purgatorio. Uh, that triggers Dante's political invective against Italy. It's the moment of, uh, which I will read very briefly, I mean, I will not read the whole thing, but it's an invective, um, uh, this, the kind of civic sense of responsibility. Uh, and he says, um, oh, Manchuan, uh, this is line 75 of Canto Six, and the gentle leader began Mantua, and the shade who had been all wrapped within himself sprang toward him from the place where he was saying, oh, Manchuan, I am Sordello, uh, of the city. He's a Provencal poet, but he wrote in Provencal and uh, from, from, uh, from Mantua. And the, se and the one embraced the other. Look at this phrase, which is extraordinary. It was in Italian. Now I feel that I can read, thanks to Margaret, I can read it, uh, Italian as, as freely as I care. E l'un l'altro abbracciava. I'll return to this construction in a moment. One embraced the other. It's it's, a, it's, it's what I call, uh, it's a phrase of reciprocity. That's why one embraced the other. The reciprocity of affections across time, okay? Dante begins his incredible uh, vituperation, his attack against enslaved Italy. Um, and, and look how it is. Uh, Italy enslaved, hostile of misery, number of metaphors, ship without pilot in great tempest, no princess among the provinces, but a brother. So eager was that noble soul only for the dear name of his city to give welcome to there to its citizens. And now in thee thy living are never free from war and of those whom one war and moat shut in, one knows at the other. Another, uh, another line that seems to have a sort of uh, uh, grim version of the reciprocity. Earlier, one embraced the other. Now, one knows that the other. But if you look at the Italian, it's really slightly different. The English doesn't give that, this translation, at least. Uh, uh, when he says, in te, line 82, no, non stanno senza guerra li vivi tuoi, e l'un l'altro si rode. One has a reflexive form, the other one does not. In the moment of violence, Dante uses the verb si rode in the reflexive form in order to imply that the exchange is an exchange that it always turns on oneself. One knows that the other for oneself. Therefore, it reverses and denies the, reproci the re reciprocity, uh, the action of reciprocity indicated by the previous, uh, the previous uh, uh, phrase. I could also uh, um, emphasize a couple of uh, details here where Dante says, uh, uh, welcome to its citizens, and now in, uh, uh, indeed I living and I never free from war and those whom one wall a moat shut in. It's a very, um, you do know that the word for community, which, which we always use, right? Community, it's a word that etymologically comes from uh, the Latin for war, mania, 
community meant and, and stems from as a concept from the sharing of walls, houses, piling and, and built one on top of the other. That's the idea of a community, the shared, the shared walls of the city, which here now are seen as, uh, are, are, are viewed as separating one from the other. And then uh, this will continue with uh, the lack of laws and the families, including the Montagues and Capulets, for you Shakespeare lovers who are mentioned here, and, uh, uh, and then Dante ends up with, uh, uh, on, on line 125, with the returning to Florence and the little uh, uh, clearly bitter satire, my Florence, thou mayst well be at ease with this digression. I'll come back to this metaphor in a moment, which does not touch thee, thanks to thy people who are so resourceful. So Dante talks about Italy, but it turns to Inferno 6 with the evocation of Florence. He's calling this, this poem, this, this invective, a digression, which literally means that it does not belong in the poem, that Dante is stepping out of the economy of the poem and talking on his own voice. It's a digression. That's what we call a digression, right? Uh, where you, uh, you use a particular language that doesn't really belong to the general plot and theme. But then the meaning of this digression is made really clear later when he says, uh, which does not touch thee. How ironic. Of course, he's saying, literally, this digression, you are so much better than all these other towns. That's the irony. Florence is no better. Therefore, this digression doesn't really concern you. But it can also be understood in another way, in, a, in another more tragic and more sinister way. This digression does not touch you. My language will not affect you. Be it, the whole statement, in all its ambiguity, becomes one of the reflection on the impotence of the poetic language to affect the historical, uh, the unfolding of, uh, of history, the ordering of the city. It is as if Dante were aware here that the relationship between the voice of the poet and the political order is one of inevitable rupture. So Dante who tries to improve and change, that's clearly the, the thrust of the passage, and the thrust of the invective also, also declares the powerlessness uh, in his, uh, his doing so good. We are doing very well with time, so I have a chance to read a little scene. Dante moves on, talking about uh, the first night of Purgatorio will take place, and uh, he takes refuge in the so-called <coughs> Valley of the Princes, where the, a new garden, another garden, is going to be described, which in many ways uh, fulfills the Garden of Limbo in Canto Four of Inferno. You know, Dante has these motifs that keep reappearing, and here it's more than a natural beauty of the place. It's 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 uh, they're precious stones, implying though Purgatorio is uh, the the world of transition. For transient souls, there is something abiding about uh, this place. And then Dante moves on. Uh, I want to read a paragraph here uh, with um, uh, the, the, the meeting with the princess. I will not read about it, but I want to read the first passage, which is the, an evening song. Uh, Dante's, Dante, the pilgrim, now is taken with uh, nostalgia for his ho hometown. It is uh, um, the pilgrimage of desire, which is the poem, right? The poem of desire, desire for God, desire for Beatrice, now turns into the desire for the comfort and the shelter of the home he had lost. So li li listen to this passage. It's, it's written in many ways in, in along the lines of Provencal poetry of nostalgia. Uh, and listen to the assonances you, the, the first six, seven lines of Canto Eight. Uh, uh, listen to the assonances, the chiastic structures of the sounds, uh, which I'm not going to point out to you. You can do that on your own. Uh, Era già l'ora che volge il disio ai naviganti e intenerisce il cuore. Lo di che han detto ai dolci amici a Dio e che lo nuovo peregrin d'amore punge so de squilla di lontano che paia il giorno pianger che si muore, quando io incominciai a render vano 
l'udire e ammirare una delle alme surta che l'ascoltar chiedea con mano. And then they hear here, I'm not going to be able to read it, but to tell you how the poem should be read. Then they go and hear a hymn, a medieval hymn, Te lucis ante terminum, and so on, which if we were really at the time, I would come to, to class with the whole Latin hymn, because we, Dante gives only the first three words, but clearly we are supposed to hear the whole thing uh, about the dangers of the night, the sense that the night is uh, fraught with phantasms, and that I will intrude on the, the powers of judgment of uh, the various souls, Dante's own included. Uh, with Canto 9, Dante moves from, as he does in every Canto 9, Canto 9 marks the rupture from a particular area of, uh, of the poem to the another, another. Remember Canto 9 of Inferno and the encounter with the failed encounter with the Medusa, the passage into the city of this. Now with Canto 9, Dante moves into purgatory proper. And so we we'll go with Canto 10, 11, and 12. We're not going to be able to do all three cantos today, so I will return to some of the things that I will say now about Canto uh, 10 and 11 that I hope to cover. Um, um, how is purgatorio, the, how, what is this purification proper going to take place? This is the ordering. Dante will go on the so-called seven deadly sins. I don't know that you know what they are, uh, but the first one, we shall see them, the first one is, and they go from spiritual sins, pride is the root of all sins, uh, to, to lust at the end. Um, in every representation of, uh, of, of this uh, sin, Dante precedes it with the representation of its opposite virtue, so that we have humility in Canto 10, and then in Canto 11, punished pride. First of all, as if Dante has to learn that which he's going to witness uh, a little later. In a sense, it's the, um, the, the uh, absolute reversal of the economy of, of inferno and purgatory. You may remember that I said last time that the incredible uh, quality of the structure of the poem is that Dante wants us to see experiences of evil in inferno first so that when we get to purgatory and paradise, we really have the chance to appreciate what the good is and appreciate what the absence of the good may be, what evil really, really uh, generates and engenders. Here now he changes all of this. In, uh, in, in purgatory, he starts with, with uh, the representation of the virtue of humility and then the sin. Um, the representation of the virtue of humility takes place through the language of art. Dante approaches the cliff, and on the sides of the cliff he sees three sculptures embodying uh, examples of humility. Uh, the word uh, uh, pride, which in Italian is, you know, we have the English superb. In Italian we call it superbia. To the word superb you add IA, which is pride. Uh, 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 the word of humility is in Italian the same thing as umiltà. The word humility means, comes from the ground, the sense of, the, of, of being down, of being the idea that one is really uh, with, let's say, the feet on the ground, the very opposite of superbia, which implies some kind of uh, immoderate flight, a way, a sense of an, uh, the, the, the view of the overman, right? The idea of being a superman, something that someone who uh, wants to transcend uh, the uh, the limitations of uh, this world and uh, the being human. Um, the, the word for humility and the word for human have the same etymology, in case you, you wonder where it comes. The homo, H-O-M-O, -O, which means man in Latin, comes from humus. We are called men, human beings, because we come from, from the earth, and we are close to the earth, and we return to the earth. Uh, we come from the earth, and we're returning to the earth. Uh, the idea of humility is the same, the same notion. So there is a, a kind of implicit connection etymologically between the two, the two words, the two terms. Um, uh, one, one more uh, remark to make, this whole idea of having a couple of remarks before I go in with the text, um, that would serve you for the rest of purgatory. The idea of um, um, having the, the, hum the virtues and the, and the vices, 
or first one and then the other, seem to cast purgatory, but it's not really that way. Uh, as a variant of a medieval poetic form called uh, psychomachia, which means the battle of uh, the battle of thoughts, uh, psychomachia. By the way, this is a, a Latin poem, one of the early Latin poems by this Latin Spanish poet called Prudentius. Uh, uh, the, so it's a, it's a kind of psychomachia, the battle of thoughts, of contradictory thoughts. The second thing that I have to say, it's more um, important for the poetics of Dante. Keep in mind that the whole poetic mode of Purgatorio, unlike the poetic mode of Inferno, is played out <coughs> in Purgatorio through the imagination, art images, memories, phantasms. In other words, we are really in a world which is in between that of bodies and souls. The world of the middle ground of the imagination. And now we have the world of art. A uh, world of art that Dante says, and I read from Cantor 10 at the very beginning. Um, I, I, I just, I just, uh, I want to give you this. Is it's, uh, it's an extraordinary, uh, I, don't, I'm, I, I don't want to go into excessive detail, but I have to, to do it this time. When we were within the threshold, Canto 10, the very beginning, of the gate which the soul's perverse love disuses, Purgatory is all a, a sequence of variations on love. That's the moral law of Purgatory. All sins in Purgatory are sins of either we use the, we give love to the wrong object, or we love too much in terms of what, how we are being loved back, or we love too little. These are the three general uh, subdivisions of purgatory. Okay, so that's perverse love disuses. Making the crooked way seem straight, by the resounding I heard, it closed again. And if I had turned my eyes to it, what excuse would have served for the fault? Reflection of what happened before. We were climbing through a cleft in the rock which kept bending one way and the other, goes around the mountain, okay? That's really what the language is. Like a wave that comes and goes when my leader began. Here, there is need to use some skill in keeping close to the side or that where it turn, turns away. The cliff, is there's an abyss underneath it. So it's an invitation to prudence along the way. And this made our steps so scant that the waning moon had regained its bed to sink to rest before we were forth from the needle's eye. But we were free, and out in the open above, where the mountain draws back, I weary and both uncertain of our way. We know now this, this has become a sort of formulaic expression of uh, the uncertainties of this exile as he moves up the mountain. We stopped on a level place more solitary than a desert track from its edge bordering on the void to the foot of the lofty bank, which rises sh uh, sheer, would measure uh, three times a man's body. And as far as my eye could make its flight, now on the left hand, now on the right, the terrors that seemed to me the same. <coughs> what is all this about? What I want to point out is that Dante is measuring the whole landscape in terms of the measure of a human being. He's using the human beings, uh, a human being as the measure. In order, is man the measure? You have heard that expression, right? Are we the measure? Are we the measure of what? Creation? Are we the measure of what we should do? This is exactly the point of the canto. Because pride means an inordinate love and belief in our own excellence. Pride means that we do not think that we, are, we can be measured by others, that we want to become the measure for others, or that we really do not belong where others may think we belong. That's what pride is. It's a sin very common. Who do you think, who do you, think you are? Who do you, don't you know who I am? This is the language we use, and it's pride. I always like to say, that we are never really proud when we are dealing with our janitor. We are not proud. We become so human, so, so good. We are always proud with those who endanger our sense of our own measure, who seem to take the wrong measure of us. 
So Dante is starting with the idea of measurement. And I come back, this is the crucial metaphor, and I come back to that. How do we measure what is human and what is not human? One thing is clear, that pride, superbia, means an inordinate love of one's own excellence. Uh, we are really far superior, uh, we think, than everybody, anybody else could have thought us. And then he goes on, uh, looking at um, images made on the white marble, such, a, such that not only Polycletus, but nature would be put to shame there. Extraordinary metaphor, already talking about, uh, about measure, and about order. Uh, these, are, these are works of art produced by the hand of God directly. God is an artist, and God has made these images. But it's such that nature, which as you know is the daughter of God and the, and, 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 and the mother of the arts, uh, and also an artist, the famous Polycletus, Greek scholar, poly, uh, Greek sculptor Polycletus, would be put to shame. Already there is the sense of rivalry within the pattern of generation of arts, okay? Uh, that's the first thing. And then the first image that we see is the image of the angel Gabriel, the messenger, who came to earth. That's humility, that's immediately came to earth, the descent the descent of the high becoming low, while the human beings who are low want to think of themselves as very high. The angel who came to earth with the decree of the many years wept for peace that opened heaven from its long interdict appeared before us so truly graven there in a gracious attitude that it did not seem a silent image. That's God's art, but very clear. There's no difficulty in understanding this art. One would have sworn, he said, Ave, uh, the first words of the angel Gabriel during the Annunciation. The Annunciation is the story of the humility whereby, obliquely, God becomes man. So that's the descent, another form of, of, of not only the, the humility of Mary in, in accepting the mandate, but also the, the, the idea of the descent. By the way, let me just point out that this Ave is what we call a bustrophedon. I have spelled the word out for you, for Eva. It's very conventional in medieval, medieval literature, the idea that uh, Mary becomes the, the one who reverses the role of Eve. Okay, with Eve, there is the, the loss of the garden and the fall. With, e, with Ave, there is now the turning of the key, as it were, and the redemption. For she was imaged there who turned the key to open the supreme love. And in her bearing, she had this wonderful imprinted, this word imprinted, et chanchilla dei. She acknowledges her, Mary acknowledges her ancillary role. She is a servant, and she acknowledges herself as a servant. And now, alongside with this, what we could call an ethical education, Dante has to learn what humility is. There is an ethical education. Learn about what this humility is about. There is also an aesthetic education going on, simultaneously. After all, Dante is really looking at art. So the question is, what is the relationship between the virtue and art? How can the two be together? And to give you an idea of how complicated the problem is, is then the next canto, Dante goes on meeting all the painters. You read Canto 11, Giotto and Cimabue, who are emblems of people who invest their productions with an inordinate val sense of their, its value. Then Dante puts himself, puts his friends, Guido Cavalcanti, you remember the two Guidos and Guido Vinicelli, he says one Guido removed uh, the other Guido from its nest and now the third person has come, meaning himself, who probably will rout both of them. What a proud statement. It is as if the artists are always prone to this sort of inordinate idea of who they are and what their value may be. So art, and humility and pride. This is the issue. The ethical education and the aesthetic education. Where is the aesthetic education? Virgil is telling Dante how to look. That's really the most complicated thing for you, those of you who are doing art history. That's really what it's about. How do we look? What do the eyes really reveal to us? Do not keep thy mind only on one part. That's, that's the looking. We, the, the belief that we or the temptation to lose sight of the totality of things and, not, uh, and, and, and just taking one part for the whole. 
Uh, do not keep thy mind only on one part, said the kind master, who had me on that side of him where the heart lies on the left, so that I turned my face and saw beyond Mary on the same side as he that prompted me another story set on the rock. So Dante has to learn how to look, and what he's looking at are stories. Story, the word is Greek, for those of you who know some Greek, it comes from I saw and I narrate. And it's the same etymology from, for story and history. This is a little bit of an allegory of history, where you see, as if Dante really begins with the New Testament, the story of Mary. Now we're going to see a picture from the Old Testament, David dancing in front of the ark, and then an episode of Trajan, the emperor, who is an example of humility. So see him in a moment. And the point is that the whole of history is a, an allegory of humility, and that's God's art. That's what Dante uh, has God represent for us. So um, Mary, etc. there, carved in the same marble, where the cart and oxen drawing the sacred ark, on account of which men fear and office not committed to them. In front, people appeared, and the whole company divided into seven choirs, made two of my senses say the one, no, the other, yes, they sing. In the same way, at the smoke of the incense that was Im Im imaged there, Eyes and nose were in contradiction with yes and no. There, the humble psalmist, David, went before the blessed vessel, girt up and dancing. At that time, he was both more and less than king. Opposite, figured on the, at the window of a great palace, Michal looked on like a woman vexed and scornful. This is really... Uh, the story that is uh, told in Samuel, in the Bible, and Dante is really <coughs> reinterpreting it for us. So I, I beg you to really pay a, a little attention to some of these uh, episodes. First of all, David is humbling himself. He's dancing. He lifts up his, uh, his ephod, his dress, and starts dancing out of joy. It's, it's an episode that is used as uh, one of the many cases of so-called ludic theology, playful theology. It's intrusion that in, in, uh, in, the, in the plan of salvation, there is always the presence of this comedy, this I comic idea, and David embodies that. Okay. And then there's this little phrase, which we, you must have noticed, appears so often in this canto, more often in this canto than ever before in the whole poem, more and less, more and less. It is as if it's impossible to use or find in a canto where measure is the issue, the precision about where we are, who we are, and what we are doing. But one thing is clear, that opposite to David, there is his wife, Michal, sitting at the window, a different perspective. And what she sees, this is art, this is a question of perspective. What well, she says, she is so angry at David because he is, by his action of dancing in front of the ark, is humiliating himself. He's losing his state as king. He's losing his stature as king. The fact is that for Dante, Michal is completely missing the point. It is a stance of someone who thinks that she's superior, a stance of someone who's sitting at the great at the window of her great palace, will not have anything to do with what's below her. We are entering the world or the, 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 the domain of what pride may be, what's wrong with pride and why pride may really be a sin. Pride may not be a sin because of we want to reach higher than we are. Well, that's probably okay. What makes pride a sin is that we tend to have contempt for what we think is below us. That's really the displacement. It blinds us. So I'm, I'm introducing here, since this is a world of art, the notion of a perspective. We've been talking about perspective. Pride is tied to perspective. Because he said, I, by being proud, I think that I have within myself, I certainly have a view of myself that may be at odds with the reality of me, right? Certainly this is the case of not David, but it's the case of Michal, his wife. The third episode 
is, is, is I think, even more more interesting. And then we'll see what's going to happen. Um, the the I moved my feet from where I was to examine close at the end another part of this. How do you examine? What is an aesthetic education? Uh, how do you look at images? At hand, another story which I saw gleaming with white, white beyond me call, depicted there. Now the third episode is from secular history, Roman history. So you have Old Testament, <laughs> New Testament, Old Testament, Roman uh, secular history. There was the glorious deed of the Roman prince whose worth moved Gregory to his great victory. I mean the Emperor Trajan. And the poor widow was his bridal in a posture of grief and in tears. The place about him seemed tr trampled and thronged with knights and the eagles on the gold. Above them moved visibly in the wind. The poor woman among all the, these seemed to say, Lord, avenge me for my son that is dead, for whom I am stricken. And he, to answer her, wait till now I return. He's going on to Romania, Disha. If you see the column of Trajan in Rome, it's still the, the, the monument document of that expedition. Uh, wait not till I return. And she, my lord, like one whose grief is urgent, if thou return not, and he, he that is in my place will do it for thee. And she, what shall another's goodness avail thee if thou art forgetful of thine own? Now take comfort, for I must fulfill my duty before I go. Justice requires and compassion bids me stay. It's the story of Trajan who gets off his high horse, levels with the little widow, the diminutives are Dante, languages of humility, the little widow, and, and administers and, and, and gives, her, gives her justice because for Dante the perfect emperor, and Trajan certainly is the perfect emperor, must, be, must have the attributes of mercy and justice, and he gives evidence of that, if for whose sight, etc. Now, um, uh, that's the drama now develops. Dante has seen all this, he has understood these images and the meaning of these images, and, uh, 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 well, I'm just going to tell you about this little drama and we stop here. Uh, uh, while I was taking delight, there's no problem in taking delight, after all this is God's, life, God's art, uh, so having delight in itself uh, is, is part of the appreciation of this art, and the images of so great uh, humilities. I think that the oxymoron is deliberate, the great humilities. Dear to sight too, for the craftsman's sake, I love them because they were made by God. Virgil prompts him, see on this side many people, the poet murmured, but coming with slow steps, they will direct us to the other stairs. And now here is Dante's drama. My eyes, which were looking intently, were not slow in turning to him, being eager for new sights. He yields to the temptations of the eye. Have you ever heard about the three temptations? The pride of life, the, the, um, the pride of the eyes, or the curiosity, of the, and, the, and, and, uh, and, 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 and the pride of the, of the heart. But I would, and the three old temptations are present here, but I would not have the reader. Dante is turning to us in an apostrophe, as he has done before. Fall away from good resolve, for hearing how God wills that the debt be paid. Do not dwell on the form. He's telling us not to care about the images as such of the torment. Think of what follows. Think that worse, it cannot go beyond the great judgment. He sort of is making a preemptive strike. Don't worry about the <coughs> peculiar form of the art. Look at the meaning of the art. And he can't. But that's what he wants us to do, he says. But look what he says to Virgil. Master began, that which I see coming to us does not seem to me persons. And I know not what they are. Confused is my sight. What an incredible contrast between what Dante had seen with God's images, all clear to him, but now that he's seeing some human beings who are doubled under massive boulders, because that's the punishment inflicted on the proud to put them and press them against the earth, he does not recognize them. It is as if his aesthetic education has been for nothing. It is as if ethical education has been for nothing. 
he had no difficulty in uh, deciphering God's art, which is so clear and, and luminous, but now he does not want to identify with what he sees. He resembles Mikol, who from high up does not want to have anything to do with David. This is the, exactly the same problem that Dante is facing. He, has, uh, he had no problem with Gabriel, the descent of Gabriel, had no problem with, uh, with Trajan, but he himself is unwilling to identify with those that he believes are uh, uh, beneath him. And then he goes on, um, uh, Virgil explains, the grievous nature of the torment doubles them to the ground so that my eyes at first were in debate about them, but he says, they are really human beings like you. And then Dante goes into a further uh, apostrophe to all Christians, calling uh, himself super, superbi in Italian, Christiani. The Italian line is actually very interesting for a reason that I'll tell you in a moment. Look at line 121. O superbi Christian, miseri lassi. There is an incredible contrast between the word superbi, meaning superior, right? A claim of superiority, and the word lassi, which means lapsed having fallen. So within the same line, you capture the two, this dynamic of how we want to be up and how we're going to, the more, the higher up we want to go, uh, the quicker we seem to be falling. Uh, or various ve weary wretches, mistranslation, who are sick in the mind's vision and put your trust in backward step steps. Do you not perceive that we are worms born to form the angelic butterfly? And I want to stress this shift in pronouns. Do you not perceive? Dante is literally taking the higher ground. We do not know. He knows, right? Do you, he, he's, he's preaching to us. Do you not perceive? But then he, with a subsequent pronoun that we are worms, he uh, literally uh, erases the distance between himself and the readers, between himself and the other Christians. He places himself on the same ground where we are. That's the quality of the double voice of Dante, systematically punctuating this text. A claim of a transcendent, superior perspective, because after all, he really has seen the whole, uh, the unfolding of, of God's cosmos. He really has witnessed it, but at the same time, he uh, descends and is part of a common plight. That's really what the line is. Do you not perceive that we are worms born to form the angelic butterfly? The, it's an allusion. The, the word for butterfly, not in Italian, but in, uh, in the Roman sarcophagy uh, in antiquity, uh, whether they are in uh, Aix-en-Provence, if you happen to go there, or you go to Fiesole, where there was a Roman, uh, um, Roman cemetery, uh, you would always see a butterfly imprinted on the sarcophagus. Because the Greek word for butterfly is psyche. It's the same word for the soul and the butterfly. And by putting the emblem of the butterfly, they indicated that death, the soul finally would be capable of flying off toward the light and toward the creator. So Dante is clearly using and, and, and remembering this kind of uh, motif that he has seen that soars to judgment without defense. Why does your mind float so high since we are, as it were, imperfect insects at a worm that is undeveloped? The language of a metamorphosis. We are in the process of making ourselves both alive and in the penitential world of purgatory. And then how he ends, look, with an iconographic motif that recapitulates the whole iconographic element that make up the poem, uh, the, the Canto 10. As for corbel to support ceiling or roof, a figure is sometimes seen joining the knees to the breast which begets from its unreality real distress in him that says it in such a posture as all these when I looked carefully. They were indeed bent down more and less, and as they had more and less on their back, and he that had most patience in his looks seemed to, by his weeping, to say, I can no more. What is this about? What is this story about? Well, the story is first of all about this, this passage. It's about the fact that Dante has just warned us not to pay attention to the form and to look at the meaning of a particular message. Now he returns to us and focuses on the form. What he's describing are the so-called cariatids, 
human forms that if you go in New York, you may see them, but certainly in European cities, these human forms that seem to be buttressing uh, edifices and buildings. And they are decorative, but Dante is saying the form matters. We cannot really go to the ultimate meaning by bypassing the form. So he is literally, uh, by picking up the, the, uh, the sculptural motif of the canto, returning to this idea. We shall see, because I, I have to leave you uh, hanging on this problem of perspective. Next time we'll read 11 and 12 and continue. Um, um, and therefore, the meaning of art, how art can change a moral perception of the world. That's the idea in which you're all wondering, have been wondering with your questions, uh, what is Dante's understanding of art? It's so dangerous and it, it can be, of course, but there is a role that art can play in altering a perception, a moral perception. And in effect, form becomes a way to go to understand uh, the moral world and the moral terms in which we are. We shall see this uh, next time. Uh, let's see if there are questions now. Um, The, the real, uh, the, I think we're approaching the, the heart of the matter in purgatory, the relationship between ethics and aesthetics. And, and what I really pointed out so far then is this idea that Dante is trying to find out what is the measure for human beings. You, you cannot say, well, it's pride. Uh, what criteria? If I want to reach you know, reach for what is so far away uh, from me, why should that be viewed as, as a sin of pride? Um, so what are the criteria? What is the context in which we can really talk of pride? And why is humility any better? We haven't touched any of this yet. Um, one thing that is clear is that Dante is, for now, uh, on the one hand, giving examples of art and humility, making mistakes, the confusion of his perception. He says that he cannot quite figure out what are the shapes that he sees. There's something disfigured he cannot quite identify with. He cannot recognize them. And then claims that we really should be should looking at the meaning, at the ultimate meaning of things. But then he returns and valorizes the idea of form. We cannot bypass form in, uh, in art or in experience. We cannot, buy, we cannot skip the idea of time. That's really what, what existentially it amounts to. That's all I really have said. And then maybe I explain to you a few etymological uh, connections, humility and the human, uh, the meaning of history, uh, and, and introduce this principle, principle of perspective that I have been talking about before, but this is really connected with the representation of art. Uh, perspective, what is the what kind of perspective does art then give us? We all know that in art we use perspectives, especially the modern language of art, the modern language of painting, ever since the 15th century, explicitly discusses the question of perspective. I see the world according to the position that I occupy in it. And the position that I occupy in it reveals things to me which are unique and irreducible. <coughs> At the same time, implies it also implies, but this is not the case, the possibility of manipulating space. The 15th century Renaissance discovers that space is not unalterable and fixed, but it can be manipulated, right? We're dealing with, up to that point, maybe we're dealing with time and the manipulation of time. You don't have to watch a football game to know what I mean about the manipulation of time. But then there is such a thing as manipulation of space. I can create the space. I can make of a sp small space something appear large. Space is not a fixed entity. That's what, what, what perspective comes to mean in the 15th century. For Dante, perspective is connected to an inner world. What is my perspective of myself? What is my sense of the measure of things? How do I view the world? Mikol gives one answer, and she can be 
angry about what David does. Misunderstanding the whole point of David. What does he misunderstand about David? That in humiliating himself, he had really found himself higher. But the idea of humiliation of self, which is exactly that of Mary, and which is exactly that of the story of Trajan. So how do you, sh Mikol does not understand the reversibility of positions. That, that's really the argument so far. And I think that Dante is making a big deal with pride because pride is seen as the root, the spiritual root of all, of all evils. Let me see if there are some, 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 some questions that I can, uh, we have a few minutes, please. In Inferno. Why, why does Dante's trouble sympathizing with the sinners in Purgatory, especially here? Because in Inferno, I mean, he even kicks some of the heads. Right. Yeah, you, you, you can't, I mean, he has sympathy, but uh, uh, when it's necessary, he just, he has had it. And, and uh, Canto 32, uh, the guy was frozen uh, and, and, and stuck in, uh, in, in ice. Uh, it wasn't pretty. Uh, it wasn't pretty. But here it's true, especially now. He has, he's, he, he declares this, his confusion. It may be because, uh, you know, I couldn't, perceive, I did not know what these forms are. And I think they have to do with the whole question of what did he learn, first of all, from, in, from, from the images that he saw. Because, you know, uh, Virgil had just taught him how to look, right? You look here, you move around, uh, don't stay in one place, you can look underneath. That's one problem. What is, an, what is a, a, a moral and an aesthetic education? And then he's just also, uh, I think, indicating the whole idea, what, is it ever possible to look at the world, more of this next time, as disengaged spectators? Think of ourselves in the theater, which is an image that I probably will bring in and discuss, you know, you go to the theater and you really, uh, sometimes you, you know, we all feel that we should jump on the stage and rescue the damsel in distress or whatever. And yet, you know, you may see someone who, do, who can do that. But many of us won't. We want to be unaffected by it. That's what Dante is doing. He would like to be, to feel that he is no longer like any of these sinners. That's the mistake he's making. It's, it's really that he's a, it's an indifference coming to him from something akin, though not exactly, to Mikol's sure sense of herself. I have nothing to do with the mob here. You know, what is, what's, what is this, is the king? I don't want to even be his wife. That's what Dante is doing in, in, uh, in that scene. Saying, I do not want to be with this kind of disfigured, lowly forms of life. I am better. I have seen God's art, and I have learned about God's art. Do you see the moral and spiritual confusion that this kind of drama is going to generate in him? And that's the answer. Uh, the one who reflects beautifully on this, I will bring the passage in, but I would like you to read it if you can. On, uh, uh, book two of the Confessions of St. Augustine. Like, uh, St. Augustine loves to go, I mean, he, do, he, he doesn't like to go to the spectacles at the Colosseum because they're so vulgar and beneath him, right? Uh, but he loves to go to the theater and he has extraordinary reflection. What does it mean to be unaffected in the theater? How do I have to understand my discomfort at the theater? It's the very image Dante uses at the end of Canto 10. Remember when he says that we see caryatids which we know are phony, and yet they can inspire some kind of distress. I'm paraphrasing very poorly the last paragraph, the last lines of Purgatorio 10. Is it possible to ever be indifferent spectators of the turmoil around us? What, and what, what's at stake when I say, well, these things don't touch me, and I'm, have nothing to do with me. And Dante is saying, they always touch us. It takes time for him to understand it, and I think that he is unveiling that. He's, he's, he's showing it to us in Canto 10. Okay? Please. Um, you said he saw a connection between form and time at some point? Yes. 
Um, Very good. Uh, do I think that I, we can uh, draw a connection between form and time? Continue uh, to make a reflection on that. And then also, if there's somewhere to join, the notion of futurity is time. And the notion of? Of future, futurity or futurity is time. Um, time necessary, the beginning. Yes. Because I'm kind of struggling with the idea of an art form, which is sort of like a fixed, immutable thing. And I know. Uh, the question is, uh, since uh, I, th I think that was implied, if I didn't say it in what I was saying, that there is a, a connection between form and time, uh, the, the, the struggle, you know, the question that becomes, we are usually think of form as something which is fixed. Uh, how can that be part of, uh, of, <laughs> of the world of time? Well, in a number of ways, I would say, that form, uh, Dante is saying, first of all, Witnessing, witnessing or watching a history, therefore it has a kind of unfolding, and he discusses art in, for, in terms of a metamorphosis, an ongoing process of change that includes the idea of time. One way in which Giotto really differentiates from what we're going to see in next canto, it's not an arbitrary relation here that I'm making, that, uh, distinguishes himself from uh, Byzantine mosaics is that uh, he introduces a history. Painting is a, a series of, of, of elements and you've got to keep looking at all of them. So it's a form, for, a, for all its unalterable quality, the form indicates, forms change. There's a history of forms to begin with. I could, I could become more genera generalized in my answer. Uh, the, the, uh, and Dante understands it in a, in a way as a, a metamorphic sequence, okay? So from that point of view, form sense for time. In fact, Dante says, you know, whenever you see a particular scene, avoid what you're seeing and see, that's what it means. Now, that is the occlusion of time. That is an eclipsing of time. Let me just go to the ideal essence, the ideal point. He says, no, it's like when you're reading a poem. You're reading a poem, of course, the form is unchanging, but unless you know the beginning, and you go start from the beginning, and you read through, i.e. time, you come to the end, you miss the point about the poem, right? I mean, I do. Um, so you gotta read, you gotta be in time. And the novel, you gotta read Proust, forget it. Pulchik, which I'm reading now, uh, that takes forever. So thank you, we'll see you next time.